Hello and welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Julia Kim coming up on this week's show. Rights groups sound the alarm over a 25% surge in executions in Iran. Despite growing public opposition, the Islamic Republic has long been a leading executioner. We'll have more from our guests up next in the program. Millions of Muslims around the world celebrate the three-day Eid al-Fatir festival, marking the end of the holy month of Ramadan. And as the war in Ukraine sends energy prices soaring, some in Lebanon are turning to illegal logging to heat their homes and to make ends meet. But first, Iran's use of the death penalty is under scrutiny again in a report by two campaign groups, the Norway-based Iran Human Rights and France's Together Against the Death Penalty. According to them, the execution rate in the Islamic Republic rose by 25% last year compared to in 2020. The number of drug-related executions rose fivefold and an increasing number of women were hanged. So what's behind this alarming rise? Well, to tell us more, we can speak to Mahmoud Amiri Mogadam, the director of the NGO Iran Human Rights, one of the groups that co-authored this report. Thank you so much for joining us on Middle East Matters today. Now... There was a surge in executions in the months following the election of a hardline cleric, Ibrahim Raisi. Do you think there's a correlation there? Thanks for having me here. So you see, the reason why uh, Islamic Republic uses that penalty is to spread fear in the society to uh, prevent protests. Um, after the election, um, we see that the number of executions are doubled compared to the time before election. And the two weeks before the elections, there were no executions. So while the international journalists are in Iran and while the world is watching what's happening inside Iran, they don't use the death penalty. But right after everybody leaves Iran, the executions go up. And I think it's a paradox that in the same period, while a uh, number of executions have doubled, Iran has been sitting together with the, some of the uh, biggest opponents of the death penalty in the world, that is uh, the French, German and uh, United Kingdom's governments, uh, and negotiating on the nuclear deal. So I think the reason why the numbers are increased is first because Iranian authorities, they are worried about uh, um, growing unrest uh, uh, inside Iran and they are worrying about coming protests. And the other is that they feel while they are sitting with the Western countries and negotiating about the nuclear deal, they, there is less scrutiny. Now, two statistics stood out for me when I was reading this report. The number of drug-related executions rising, rising fivefold and the increasing number of women being executed. Why do you think there is a rise in the execution of these two groups? Um, the victims are normally uh, the weakest in the society. Uh, Iranian authorities, they prefer using uh, um, uh, victims uh, whose execution has lower political cost. People who are uh, arrested for drug-related uh, offenses, uh, normally they are from marginalized part of the society. Many of them belong to the Baluch uh, ethnic minority. And their execution uh, doesn't lead to as much attention or reactions, both nationally and internationally. And that's very unfortunate. When it comes to women, of course, women are also uh, among the weakest in the Iranian society. They, uh, you know, they don't have equal rights and um, out of the 17 women who were executed, 12 were sentenced for murder and eight of them were convicted of killing their husbands. There were uh, several reports of domestic violence. So I think it's a very complicated picture. Now, you mentioned as well earlier that this is, of course, happening as Western powers, world powers try to revive the Iran nuclear deal. Now, you've mentioned that you'd like to uh, see more scrutiny and that the protection of people's rights be an integral part of the newer JCPOA. Do you think that this is going to happen? What would you like to see happen during these ongoing negotiations? I really hope 
that it will happen because uh, um, at the present moment, international com community, the world uh, powers, they are following a short term policy towards the Islamic Republic. We know that any nuclear deal, which is based uh, only on the nuclear activities, it's not going to uh, be sustainable. We have an example uh, from history, you know, during the uh, apartheid regime in South Africa, that regime had also a controversial nuclear program. But once the apartheid was gone, that program was not relevant anymore. I think everybody, also the world leaders know that Iranian authorities biggest fear is not an international attack, but it is from within the country. They are afraid of people. You know, they can't solve people's daily problems uh, and they don't have people's support. So I think if we solve that issue, then the nuclear program will not uh, be relevant anymore. So we should think long term. And I believe that putting Iranian people's rights human rights, and in particular the death penalty, on top of the agenda, that will uh, lead us to a more sustainable peace and stability. Mahmoud Amiri Mogazam, thank you very much for joining us on Middle East Matters. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Well, moving on now, the row between Israel and Russia continues to escalate. The Russian Foreign Ministry accusing Tel Aviv of supporting neo-Nazis in Ukraine. This after Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov claimed that Hitler had Jewish roots, comparing him to Ukraine's Jewish president, Volodymyr Zelensky. The incident has caused uproar in Israel, which has called Lavrov's comment unforgivable. Israel supports Ukraine, but it's avoided directly criticizing Moscow over the invasion and has not formally sanctioned Russian oligarchs. Now, 1.8 billion Muslims across the world celebrated Eid al-Fitr, or the festival of breaking the fast. It marks the end of the holy month of Ramadan. Now, in many countries, this year's festivities were the first without COVID restrictions, but they took place uh, in the context of rising global food prices, exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. James Vizina has this report. After a month's fasting comes the time for a three-day holiday, and worshippers fill Saudi Arabia's Grand Mosque in Mecca to its full capacity once again. With Eid festivities curbed in many countries over the past two years due to COVID-19, large-scale gatherings are back, like here in Egypt. We came here today after being allowed back in for prayers. We're extremely happy. We were prevented from coming to the mosque and gatherings. It was really hard. Depending on the sighting of the moon, mass prayers began between Sunday and Tuesday. But as festivities resume, the increased cost of living in many parts of the world is affecting the holiday. Western sanctions on Russian oil have led to increases in the price of wheat across the Middle East, while two-thirds of Lebanon's population are now living in poverty following the economy's collapse. Last year we were more comfortable. We were able to buy the children desserts to make them happy or buy them clothes. This Eid, nothing. We can't buy them anything. A shadow cast over one of Islam's main holidays as economic woes continue to affect livelihoods worldwide. And we stay in Lebanon, where soaring energy prices have forced some people to turn to illegal logging. Desperate people trying to stay warm are cutting down trees from neighboring forests and also selling the wood on the black market. Ellen Gainsford and Yenna Lee have the story. There are charred gaps in the forest on these mountains in Lebanon. Over several kilometers, all that's left are tree stumps. They're pine trees that have fallen victim to illegal logging. Elias Fares is a mountain guide who is bearing witness to the problem. This was cut less than a month ago. The smell of petrol is still present. One person can chop down around 100 trees in a day. The loggers first start a fire in the forest. It gives them an excuse to cut down what they say are dead trees, even if it's banned. The country is burning its forests for warmth. 
in the mountains, we run into some illegal loggers. They don't want to talk on camera, but they agreed to be filmed. The three men are collecting wood they plan to sell on the black market in Lebanon or even in Syria. Our guide recognizes them, but he doesn't plan on turning them in to the authorities. It's not my job to do that. It would create a big problem for us. They use revolvers. They could pull out a gun? I don't know, yes. Recently, a gunfight broke out between rival loggers in the forest. Police officers don't come to this area. It's become an open secret who takes part in the trade. The shepherd also knows who the illegal loggers are. They are people from the surrounding villages. They cut the wood to keep warm. Throughout the region and even in the capital Beirut, piles of logs can be seen on the doorsteps of homes as Lebanese people try to stay warm. 74-year-old Samira Bashara and her children use the forest for heat. The dressmaker is having to use a mechanical pedal on her sewing machine due to unreliable electricity. And she's had to swap her radiator for a log burner. I used it last year, but this year we can't, as heating oil is too expensive. A typical Lebanese salary only allows for around five days of heating oil a year. Wood is six times cheaper. Not much of it is left in Mrs. Bashara's own garden. Oh la la, we have already used a lot of wood. The pine and cedar trees, the country's symbol, will take more than 20 years to regrow. Over half of the country's forests have now been affected by illegal logging. That's it for this edition of Middle East Matters. Thanks for watching. There's more news coming up here on France 24. Stay with us.